I'm going to be talking to you a little bit today about what I've learned over the years um, and particularly in this last uh, summer period about water conservation and some of the tools and tactics and innovative ways that I've seen uh, being applied in different communities that we work in to affect water conservation. I put drought silver lining up here because I think this past year really opened many people's eyes to the finiteness of our water supply, something that those of us who work in the environmental field, particularly in watersheds, have been well aware of. And I start with a little uh, overview of a map, a couple maps actually, that the state issued a few years ago where they uh, actually became more aware, finally, of the things that we've been saying to them, that we've been seeing out in the field. Those pictures that Michelle showed you of stream flow uh, drying up um, and how that being impacted by water withdrawals. This is a map that shows, with reds being uh, the worst affected uh, uh, sub-basins within our region to water withdrawals. This is a, a statistical category that's calculated uh, from the percent of August estimated unaffected stream flow that's pumped from all wells in or upstream of the subbasin. So, for example, if a subbasin's estimated August unaffected stream flow is 2 million gallons per day, that is 2 million gallons going downstream, um, and the total August groundwater pumping in and upstream of the subbasin is a million gallons per day, then the August well pumping is 50% of that. So, if you see the red, we're saying that greater than 55% of the unaffected stream flow is being pumped out of that basin. So obviously that means you're taking a lot out, so we're stressing that basin. We know that that's not the only thing that affects stream flow though, because we actually put water back in when we have septic systems. And so this is another map that the state issued um, in our area that talks about the net groundwater depletion as a measure of the influence of all groundwater withdrawals and discharges back to stream flow. Um, and so I don't want to belabor the point, but the, the point is, is that these are stressed subbasins that in eastern Massachusetts in particular, we have a lot of demand being placed on these small subbasins. Um, and if you look at this, you might think, well, there's, there's a lot of blue there that might be, um, you know, not so badly impacted. But one of the things that if you look at that is, is that we have a lot of population and development in the area. So there's not that many places left to go to put more holes in the ground. The talk today is about conserving the resources that we have. And what I'm trying to show you here is, is that, the, that the resources are stressed. We don't have more resources to go get. And so we're going to have to figure out how to live within the, the confines of the, the water resources that we have and hopefully even um, by the time you hear the end of this talk, you'll think that we might actually be able to improve those resources. But they definitely are stressed, and they're definitely finite, and this summer I think we saw that uh, much more so in the public's eye than ever before. So one of the tools in the toolboxes of drought, I mean of uh, water conservation, um, first is to understand who uses how much water when. So um, this is something that we've done in Situate. It's something we've done in the town of Norwell. It's something that we've done in the town of Hingham. Uh, the first question we should ask ourselves when we are trying to determine how to apply water conservation measures is who's using how much water when. You'd be surprised at how little people who are running our water supplies know about that. They know it intuitively, but they don't have the time. They're too busy making the water to go and really analyze their customer demand and to understand where that water is being used and how much. Now, the graphs I'm going to show you are representative of the town of Situate. They are uh, pretty much, for communities like Situate, they're suburban, um, residentially uh, developed, um, like most of Southeastern Mass. And so you, these data would be probably similar to what you might find in other towns. But I will urge people to think about having this be done in their own town because as we know, I think um, towns are parochial, we're parochial, and oftentimes we don't believe that that's the same as what we would do. In other words, uh, have your town look at their water supply and do this demand analysis because uh, nothing uh, convinces people more than looking in the mirror. This is just a graph of the account distribution by the number of accounts how many are in single family. You can see again 
The majority are in a single family category. The town uses about 1%, that's the municipal's uh, demand. Uh, commercial, not heavily uh, commercialized in sound of situate, some multifamily, but largely single family usage going on here. Okay, so that's the majority of the usage in the town. So let's look at and break that down by uh, percent. And you can see um, that the top 25% of the customers are using about 47% of the water. And the bottom 50% are using 27.5%. So we've got a, 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 a small group at the top end using a lot of water. And that's something that we see time and time again. So back in 2011, we had done that analysis and we focused uh, on that top tier and we said, we made a presumption that, uh, and we also looked at summertime usage, and we made a presumption that uh, automatic irrigation systems were having a significant increase in water demand in the summertime, and we uh, used that breakdown of data to convince the town, whose water commissioners are also the town selectmen, to implement an irrigation restricted, uh, restriction on automatic irrigation systems only we asked them to put into effect only allowing watering one time a week, um, um, one time a week, uh, based on voting precinct. Uh, we based it on a pilot effort that was done in the town of Franklin that actually used trash days. Uh, the town of Citra didn't have trash pickups, so we used their voting precinct. We sent brochures to all of the water customers in the town, educating them about it, and then. In fact, you see on the, the left-hand side, that picture is the picture of their reservoir. So they're lucky in that they actually have some feedback through their surface waters uh, reservoirs to see some of the impacts of the water withdrawals. And we had great success. And in fact, uh, after that year, we uh, sent out a survey to the customers, that all the customers are 7,000 households. 82% uh, of the customers felt that the restriction was a good idea. And we did that because we wanted to have the town forefathers not go back on this. We didn't want to backslide. And we wanted them to have the political support that they needed to make this a permanent condition. This is just a data from comparing prior to the irrigation restriction, averaging between 2007 and 2010, and after the restriction was in place from 2011 to 2013. And we had a net uh, savings of 380,000 gallons per day which is um, pretty much a pumping well in a town usually. So it's a big gain that we got from asking people to go from what probably was daily automatic irrigation systems going off to weekly, once a week. Um, and as far as I know, um, things are still okay in the town of Situate. People are still selling and buying houses there. Um, people shower. <laughs> Life is good. So um, there's great gains to be made in water conservation, particularly in that outdoor um, watering component. So, so that's one tool in the toolbox. And so the tools in that part are look at yourself in the mirror, get some data about your system so that you can defend and target your conservation, and then go back, do something, then measure it again so that you can show people that you're having progress. And it's, it's, uh, it's been very successful. Um, in fact, uh, just recently we went back and uh, had our staff scientist, Derek Grady, um, look at the town of Citriot's uh, summer water demand from 2009. Uh, you can see how it was higher uh, in that top tier of users. Um, and then that precipitous drop in 2011. Then we kind of plateaued. You know, maybe sort of wandering around a little bit higher, people get complacent. And then in 2016, you see, again, further drop in that, cons in that irrigation. So there's probably still more room um, to, to save water and irrigation. I mean, part of it is uh, how much enforcement's going on and, and how much awareness is going on, whether people are really abiding by the regulations. Um, but clearly, uh, in 2016, when, when uh, things got tighter, people were able to even save more. So the unfortunate potential consequence of having an irrigation restriction placed on your public water supply is that some people uh, will then go off and decide to put a well into, um, <laughs> into their yard because they want to have the irrigation system. And in fact, one of my um, board members, um, this last summer, he lives in Situate, and uh, his telephone number apparently is very close to 
the number of a well driller's number. And <laughs> He, uh, he said his phone was ringing off the hook. He was sure, though, that he got at least 50% of them to understand that these wells were still in the same watershed as, as the public water supply and that maybe we shouldn't be taking uh, and putting more straws in the ground. Unfortunately, I can't divert all of those calls to him. Um, but uh, there are ways that we can talk to people about how to manage private wells as well. As well. And um, Massachusetts Rivers Alliance, uh, just this past year, did a, a survey of 58 communities in the, town, in the state of Massachusetts, um, asking them about their private well, private wells, private well bylaws, um, and some of the obstacles that they perceived to implementing a private well bylaw. They found four communities have private well bylaws, Hamilton, Wenham, Topsfield, and Falmouth. And the obstacles that were most cited by the communities that they spoke with uh, included the top one was the bylaw, uh, a bylaw including private wells has never been considered. In other words, nobody's brought it up. The other one was that the town does not have the authority, or there's concern that the town might not have the authority to regulate private wells. One of the things that the paper cites is that there's been no lawsuits to date, and I was actually just talking to the writer of the paper who's here today, um, and there is. Um, so uh, a bylaw uh, being published by DP soon, hopefully, that's been vetted by the AG's office that they think is strong and will, uh, you know, is, is defensible. That there's probably, um, you know, good, good hope to think that you have all the rights in uh, your community to implement such a thing. So, so, so one of the things that I want to tell you about here is this, I think the issue is, is that not a lot of people have brought it up. So for those who are in the watershed associations and those who are living in your communities and worried about this issue, bring it up. See if you can get this passed. Um, because the more that we do this, the more that it'll be easier the next town over. So another thing that um, I saw happen a lot more this summer than um, I usually do is enforcement. Unfortunately, we don't have a cool car like so this must be like San Diego or LA. But people in uniform do get listened to. And this year in the town of Norwell, which historically has told me that they don't want to be the water police, um, and they're the ones that have that brook, the third hearing brook that you saw the picture of, totally dry this summer. They had some really, um, they were really concerned that they were going to run out of water, quite literally. And uh, so that motivated them to go out and uh, start to enforce watering restrictions that they had in place. Um, and one of the tools that they used was uh, having their meter readers go out and me read the meters in their community. Um, and then they went back out a week later and um, they identified the people who they identified the people who were the top 100 users. They sent them letters. They um, looked at the meters th the week later, see who behaved and who didn't, who's naughty, who's nice. It's like Santa. Then they went back out and started knocking on doors and finding people and then threatening them. And you could, there was very few people who, after several attempts, didn't comply. So. Enforcement is actually an important aspect of what needs to be done. And the towns, unfortunately, you know, politically it's not easy, um, it's not popular, um, but having targeted enforcement is um, an important part. You know, we have laws and they should be enforced to some extent. I mean, we can't cover everybody, um, but we have speed limits and we, you know, have targeted enforcement of those, it's the same idea. And this is a public health issue. We shouldn't really be waiting until this drought to, to do that because it becomes um, harder. So technology, I've uh, been looking at a few different communities in our area, the town of Sharon and I think maybe the town of Medford in Massachusetts have, and actually Dedham and Westwood now, are looking at how we can use technology to have better feedback to our residents. So they have great promise. I don't know that they've been implemented long enough for us to have real data to share with you. But what I've heard is, you know, there's great promise with these types of technologies to uh, collect the data that we have on water use and to feed that back to you via um, an email, your mobile app, um, that kind of thing. 
But the challenges are to get people to sign up. You have to have people who are willing to uh, sign up with their email. Uh, the demographic may be challenged to, to use that depending upon um, the age group of your, the age structure of your community. Data may be limited and not real time depending on the system. So many of our communities take meter readings you know, once every three months and so that's the, the you're not going to get today's data, I used this much water, you're going to get sort of old data. But it's still um, not a bad uh, feedback loop. It's similar to the work that uh, the um, utilities, the gas utilities are doing now in your billing, where they give you your comparison to your nearest neighbor on how much gas you're using. They find that, um, you know, that kind of social marketing is a way for people to um, compare their usage, to get a sense of what the context is, and to uh, feel the social pressure of wanting to do better. Um, the other things that the technology, um, you know, it looks really good, but then the fact is you still need staff to operate this technology and customize the messaging. A lot of this technology is coming out of California, so a lot of the messaging is really more California-based. So it's the, you don't want to use their canned messages. You need to have it be adapted uh, to the New England climate. Um, and it costs money. It's, um, it's not a panacea. So um, I think there's great promise. I'd like to see some more um, results from it before I would recommend it to a community. But I'm keeping my eye on it. And, and the two uh, companies that I've seen so far, one's called Water Smart, and the other's called Drop Counter. So Water Smart's being used by the town of Sharon and I think Medford, um, and the drop counter is being used by Dedham Westwood. So keep posted on that. Another uh, tool in the toolbox in terms of water conservation that I've seen used is uh, water, implementing a water balance policy in the community. In Hingham, in Hull, uh, it's owned by uh, the water company there, is a private water company. They, the Weir River is o over withdrawn and they implemented a water balance policy in the early 2000s. Uh, I think Weymouth, the city of Weymouth has also done that. Both at the time were under consent decrees from DEP because of over withdrawals. Um, and there isn't really any additional water to be had in those particular locations. So what, how to be able to provide water to the new development? Um, in the case of Hingham, they have a one-to-one -one uh, balance ratio. So if a developer comes in and it, it's at a certain scale, it's not a single family home, but if you have multiple homes and you read a certain th reach a certain threshold, then you have to, the developer has to find a gallon of water for every gallon of water that he wants or she wants um, in the system so that they provide uh, retrofits of municipal buildings uh, to plumbing. Uh, they provide um, uh, water um, conservation education funding. They provide um, money to the to the uh, water utility to fix leaks um, and to run water conservation programming. So that's one opportunity. I put the two bottles of water here because I would like to see people have two for one. Let's get better. Let's not just stay neutral. Let's actually in the stressed basins or areas where our rivers are drying up, let's ask um, people to to do better than that and make, make a net positive gain. So this, this summer in particular, it was um, obvious that education and feedback actually matter. The sign on there is um, a sign that the Watershed Association that I work for put up in the first Herringbrook Watershed to remind people um, of the connection between nature and the water flows. This is right outside of the old oak and bucket um, water treatment plant in the town of Citrate on Route 3A. And we changed that sign from green to red depending upon conditions. So this past summer, uh, the town of Situate, uh, you may have heard about them in the news, they were definitely um, trying to uh, conserve their way out of the drought. They had about 20% um, left in their reservoir or 20 days left in their reservoir. They also had groundwater, so they weren't completely without water or anything, but they, they really needed to, to be conservative. And um, what they implemented was a weekly email that provided uh, uh, customers an um, understanding of where the supply of the water was, what the condition of that supply was, 
and what the uh, rainfall precipitation pattern was and what the forecast was and then tips about how they could conserve. So it gives the customer direct understanding of the current and local situation and then gives them tools and information about how to um, be a more conserving household. This was uh, a campaign uh, that not only us but the town of Sharon implemented um, and uh, it was sort of adapted from a San Francisco campaign and we printed these out and, and got uh, lawn signs and gave them to people who were interested in sort of promoting that they weren't going to water their lawn. In fact, that's kind of cool not to do. Make it socially unacceptable to, to do these things. So in the town of Hingham, where um, uh, again they have a stressed river, uh, they also have been implementing now monthly updates on their water. So they're continuing not just to be within the drought to have this feedback, but they're going to keep that, that, that method going and keep that communication, which I think is fabulous. And they also uh, just started um, a new campaign to provide rebates on um, water conserving indoor fixtures, but also they're offering a $2,500 rebate for eligible landscaping costs for those interested in eliminating their outdoor irrigation systems. So we'll see to the extent it gets taken up by them, but the point also is it's a message. It is a message to the customers that this is not something we want to have you use your water on. So I think again, um, the more and more that we make this a social the unacceptable way to use water, the more likely we are to have success there. Another way that um, we have seen people um, provide education is through the use of educational videos. This is a video that uh, was in situate this year. This is something in Hingham that we did with the, high, the hockey team, young hockey team. So we got a high school, I mean, we've got a, a hockey team, young hockey team to um, talk about watering, not watering, because they were worried that it was going to drain their skating pond. Wow, look at that. That's our skating pond just going down the drain. That stinks. It sure does. What a waste. Do you know how much water it takes to water just one inch over one acre? I know, 27,000 gallons. Thanks, that's more than my swimming pool. Yeah, and at an inch a week, it could be 10 swimming pools by the end of the summer. Bummer! Let's rethink lawn watering! The use of children, um, <laughs> cute children, um, but you know what was really interesting about that was it got the parents involved, you know the whole network of hockey people was involved in making that and so it was a really nice way to involve the community in spreading the message and having it be from that youthful point of view and I think they got a pizza party for it. The town of Situate also this year did similar types of things although not with uh, youth they had uh, more of the this old house approach. Um, one of the water uh, uh, managers was like showing people how to calculate their own water consumption on a video and we were you know putting that out on Facebook and other means. So talking to people um, through video and social media uh, with these messages is, is really a, a very uh, productive way of getting the word out. Um, but we also don't want to wait for the drought. One of the things that we've been very effective at getting into the community is creating a water conservation ethic with young people. We go into the schools within 10 communities on the South Shore and provide basic watershed education. So don't wait for a drought to people to be knowledgeable about this. And when we do this, we invite uh, parents to, the, to be the volunteers that help us run some of the interactive stations. So every year we have about 2,500 students go through the program and we have about 350 parents. And it never uh, ceases to amaze me how the parents are, are learning as much as the children. So I'm gonna end this with sort of um, a, a posit to you. Um, uh, that I think that each of us needs to really think about and which is to need we need to change our relationship to water and create a water ethic that values water from appreciating our local streams to pricing water right we need to work together to use less and less rather than fight each other fight each other over uh, grabbing more and more 
we need to try to keep water local. When we don't have water local to us, um, it loses some of its value to us. So even putting a rain barrel uh, in your yard can help you understand the volumes of water and the difference, the value of that water. We need to avoid over tapping our aquifers and surface waters and over relying on costly fixes that have unintended consequences. Over and over again, we see these um, engineering solutions that really um, cost us money and ultimately don't necessarily save us in the end. They might be a short-term fix, but ultimately they aren't the long-term fix. We need to leave as much as prudently possible in nature and then use the right water for the right use. We should not be flushing our toilets with high quality drinking water. We need to think about how we can get gray water use into our plumbing code and make it easier for people to do that. We need to think about how we can harvest rainwater to irrigate our gardens and maybe even to drink. The amount of rain that falls on a 1,500 square foot home is actually just about the amount of, in this climate, in our 44 inch per year um, rain, is about the same amount of water for a conserving household of four would need. Using native plants and reducing our lawns, reusing our wastewater for irrigation and gasp recycling it back up into the watershed for drinking. That would be the ultimate recycle. These ideas are not just mine. Um, there's a wonderful book that I would recommend to you called The Blue Revolution, The Unmaking of America's Water Crisis that talks a lot about how we can make this water ethic come true. Thank you.